So you just did me a great favor because instead of being confused with Berkeley, you did San Diego, but I'm actually from UCLA. <laughs> but I love it because I'll be able to tell this story for a while. So um, I guess that's also my thanks for putting me after um, the uh, Esri talk, which was uh, wonderful and inspiring. So this uh, Web 2.0, as you all know, is about location. And uh, in this particular talk, I want to talk about location over time. So uh, we've been looking at how we can leverage these traces uh, that are basically the time series of our location uh, over time and ways in which they are very telling because of all that can be inferred from them. And uh, they are telling and they are so readily available now, obviously, because of the fact that we're all carrying around with us mobile phones. And this is a technology that is with people in a, with a pervasiveness that we really haven't seen before. And very importantly, it's not just the mobile. Everything you hear about here is about all of those maps and all of that GIS and all of the information that's behind it. So it's not just that it's real time and real place. It's all of the context that it has because it's always connected and with the full web behind it. So there's just a tremendous amount that we can learn and that we can share by uh, recording and analyzing this information. And it's very much a technology, uh, as we're looking at it, uh, it's a technology about engagement. So it's not just about passive collection for somebody else. It's about people being engaged with the data uh, that they're collecting. And so this is a little bit different from just the focus, complementary to the focus of your mobile carrier or even Skyhook uh, having data about you or its customers. This is really about individuals uh, having information about themselves and what can they learn from that through the sort of wealth of, of analytics that we were just hearing about. And yet, uh, having started working in this area and being very interested in, in, in capturing traces, I do have an interest on the other side of this as well, because they're not just telling traces for us as individuals, they're telling traces for others as well. Uh, but before you sort of write me off as a uh, over-the-hill you know, privacy fiend, I really want to spend the, the first part of the talk saying the interesting things that we're doing with them, because that is really what has uh, attracted me to this technology, is how easy it is to capture these traces and the richness of them in the positive, constructive sense of what you can, uh, of what you can infer. And I'll come back at the end to talk about privacy. Uh, so uh, just consider smartphone applications that are continuously recording your GPS and accelerometer readings. And out of that, then, you have a location activity time series. And for all practical purpose, this really gives us a very good sense of what we're doing 24 by 7, again, because of all the mapping and, and model and GIS-based information uh, that we can mash it up with. And there are a lot of very interesting aggregating projects that use these traces as a kind of a community mapping tool. Um, uh, my, my favorite is Waze, which is using sampling of automotive uh, traffic on uninstrumented streets to, to build um, and really create the best source of local and live uh, traffic information when it's used by even a pretty impressively small percentage of the population. Um, but or and, there are also applications that don't even require or depend on that minimum level of penetration. And Peer is an example of an application that I'm just using my location trace to mash it up with information that the Air Resources Board maintains about particulate matter concentration. And so then I can see how my commute patterns and my choices about time of day uh, and, the, and the paths that I choose to take, and as I compare one path to another, I can, based on my location activity trace, see my particular uh, pollution uh, exposure levels or I can compute my particular, uh, uh, do a, a very personalized carbon calculator. So it's very much an example of what you were seeing before, but I'm taking my location trace and mashing it up and sort of doing an integration across the background maps and analytics about the temporal spatial uh, uh, dynamics of air pollution and making it personal. And this is useful one person at a time. So long as that GIS data is back there, 
I can make use of my location traces to look at how different days or weeks or months uh, uh, compare one to another. And uh, my favorite example of usage of this was actually last year up in the Bay Area, a group of high school kids used the carbon calculator aspect of it uh, to compare, they, they made an effort across a bunch of classes in a competition who could reduce their carbon impact a class at a time by changing their transportation behaviors. Instead of just using a diary, they ran uh, this location tracing application on their phone and that data is automatically uploaded to their personal uh, peer application. And then they uh, designed a little Facebook widget by which they shared their aggregate uh, uh, carbon um, impact over time. So an interesting example of that, making use of your location trace in a kind of a, a, a mashup on, on steroids, if you will. And Okay, so maybe uh, a, a fixation on air pollution is a bit Southern California, uh, if you will, particularly Los Angeles uh, as opposed to San Diego. Um, but that same type of data stream can be combined with that powerful inference and visualization that we were just hearing about to really address a broad array of health and wellness concerns. And so uh, perhaps a, a poor play on words, but really I think of, of health and wellness as being the killer app for this kind of participatory sensing. And it's that um, it's really the other side of personalizing healthcare. So a lot of focus on personalized healthcare is all about your genes and your genetic makeup and your tendencies, all very important and powerful things. But the other side of health has to do with environment and exposure and behavior. And so now we have these tools that are even uh, uh, farther evolved um, than on the, on the genomic side to really get up and close and personal and tell me about and give me refined feedback really across all the hours and minutes of my, of my day and, and week. So in this, con in this context, actually, it's not just about those automated activity traces that come from me recording my GPS and accelerometer and doing some uh, uh, calculations over them. Here, it's also combining that with a technology and a methodology that's been around for a long time, but is now really enabled by mobiles, which is experience sampling. And so here, you are in the background doing the activity capture, but you also have uh, timed location prompted inputs asking me about whatever it is that I'm trying uh, to track in more detail. So consider someone struggling with um, diabetes and hypertension. Turns out it's really hard to, to, uh, to control and stabilize hypertension when you're a diabetic. And the side effects of medication from hypertension are often much more palpable than the disease itself. So 60% of people drop their hypertension medication after six months. And so one of the uh, concepts here that we're exploring with people in, in health sciences is that when you get a prescription for ad adjustment of your medication, you should also be prescribed for a week or two some self-analytics in which you're being probed about your side effects in the last hour, rate your dizziness, okay? What was the quality of your sleep? Take your meds, confirm that you took them, uh, measure your blood pressure and your blood glucose at those times. Each one of those measurements are no longer no, not just a threshold, are you in danger or not, they're a data point. And so those subtler patterns can combine and become really what we think of as, like, as, a, as a living uh, record. So this is, these are not things you will necessarily run 24 by 7, 365 days of the year. Rather, they're things that you bring into play to bring more detailed and personalized information to your clinician perhaps, but also to you, because a big component of health increasingly, and really the only scalable way that we as a country and a world can become healthier, is through our personal habits and the choices uh, and the choices we make. And so that notion of a coach in your pocket with that kind of feedback that you can get in a very uh, affordable way. I want to put in a little... Um, uh, uh, point you to one of our graduate students we're particularly proud of and also make the point that this isn't something that necessarily requires a smartphone in all cases. We were inspired to a lot of these things because of the cap capabilities of smartphones and there's a lot you can do with simple phones as well. So Nathan Yao's uh, Your Flowing Data, really interesting site and brings up how important, as we were just hearing about, giving people tools for the analytics is. So that he gives you a set of canned tools by which you can look at your trends over time on whatever small issue you're trying to track, observe, and change. Okay, so the flip side of all of this is that while these traces are very powerful and there's so much we can do by combining 
all of the power of modeling and analytics and GIS and the web with our personal traces to give us back personal and then and community scale information. In some context, in their raw form, shared in their raw form, um, in some ways and for some folks, this might be a bit too powerful. These living records are really pre-transactional. In some sense, they are more private than my search patterns, my Amazon purchases. Um, these are really, in some ways, they're as private as my thoughts, right? The notion of every place I've been, how much time I've spent there uh, over time, and exactly how I felt when I was there, and how my blood pressure reacted to a particular meeting at work or, uh, or, or anticipation of one. These traces quantify our habits, our routines, our associations, and they're really trivial to mine. So much more uh, of concern to me than the cameras in London is uh, the, the ready availability of these traces. And they really can't be effectively anonymized, as was shown early on by John Crum up at, up at Microsoft. Um, and it's different than my credit card records. It's different than my cell phone carrier's records of me, because I'm not a regulated industry. What's frightening to me about it, or drives me to want to, uh, to put some attention here architecturally, is that it's individuals who are free to record their own data and share them in exchange for a 50 cent coupon, or share them and start sharing them out of some interesting social interaction, but uh, uh, then that data is really uh, available and propagating. So I'm not against making use of these traces. I just think we can, alongside of it, start to introduce some technical and, to some extent, legal practices that can help. And so the notion of a personal data vault where your raw traces go into a secure container in the cloud. You're not going to put, you don't want to keep them on your cell phone, just like you don't keep your money in your mattress. But that these raw traces of location activity and my experience sampling go into a container that I have continuous engagement with, support for visualization on, and then I turn on spigots of releasing of information to my clinician. My clinician might want to know to what extent, now that I've adjusted my medication, my sleep is more or less disrupted. He or she doesn't need to know where I've been sleeping. Maybe my personal coach does want to see something about how sensitive I am to sleeping in hotels versus at home, and in that context, you turn on some of that release. So the technology is perfectly uh, available for doing this sort of thing. Uh, it's a matter of starting to introduce that sort of practice, and I think it's a matter from the commercial perspective of being um, perhaps uh, less greedy initially with the notion that we should get all the raw data we can uh, because we'll be able to uh, mine it to the greatest extent. I think we can start as technologists and as innovators to set that bar a little higher and promote a kind of a shared use and best practices that are in the end going to be uh, better from a public good perspective and I think going to save a lot of... Um, uh, commercial enterprises from headaches of dealing with far too many subpoenas um, and even more than, uh, than they do now. So um, with that, I just want to um, uh, uh, close and say that there are a lot of challenges here, right? Diaries are discoverable, can be subpoenaed. So what does that mean now in the context for this sort of information? It's not just from a technical perspective that we probably need to take uh, action as innovators and, and technologists. It's also perhaps from a legal perspective that we need to go back to some of those uh, basic rules about what's discoverable and go back and say, maybe this is a kind of raw data that I should be able to have a self-practice of self-analytics and it will be very uh, important for the health and, and well-being and behavior change of, of, of our nation and our world, but I need more protection uh, over that sort of data. So very powerful uh, technologies and uh, worthy of some new best practices and mechanisms.